El día de hoy el, el estudio y el libro que estamos presentando es producto del trabajo de, de un grupo grande de, de, de economistas de mi departamento, del, del departamento de investigación, del departamento legal, eh, donde básicamente estudiaron y viajaron por, por la región para entender cuáles pueden ser las políticas que pueden ayudar a profundizar el proceso de integración financiera a nivel regional y básicamente el énfasis en la integración regional viene debido a que los cambios regulatorios a nivel internacional y los cambios un poco en la inclinación de política con respecto a la integración en general, no solo la financiera en el mundo avanzado, pues básicamente parecen estar al menos retrasando el, el proceso de globalización en un momento en los cuales los países de América Latina están claramente decididos a seguir avanzando en este, en este proceso. Entonces, en este entorno, lo que nosotros pensábamos es que pues una de las vías más eh, eh, redituables, si los países de la región quieren seguir avanzando en el proceso de integración, es básicamente buscar vías para facilitar la integración regional, tanto en el ámbito comercial como en el ámbito financiero. Y este, este, este libro básicamente se enfoca en la parte, en la parte financiera y, y, y básicamente plantea eh, cuáles son aquellas utilizando las plataformas que ya existen, como puede ser la Alianza del Pacífico, Mercosur, por otro lado, y otro tipo de acuerdos eh, bilaterales que tienen los países, cómo podemos profundizar en modificar, homologar, etcétera, los marcos eh, regulatorios para facilitar la integración financiera a nivel, a nivel regional. El estudio eh, tomó siete países para eh, eh, hacer ciertos estudios de caso, pero la propuesta es una propuesta regional. Los siete países que se estudiaron son los cuatro de la Alianza del Pacífico, los cuatro miembros originales de la Alianza del Pacífico, más Brasil, Uruguay y, y, y Panamá. Y obviamente el, el estudio cubre eh, la parte bancaria, la parte de, eh, de seguros, la parte de pensiones y la parte de infraestructura de, de, de mercados. Entonces, sin más, eh, les dejo a, a, a mis colegas que harán un, una presentación que resume los principales, eh, eh, los, el análisis y las principales recomendaciones que tiene el estudio. I'll start this afternoon with a, a quick outline of the way we structure our presentation today. In the first section, I'm going to motivate why we believe the theme of financial integration is relevant at this point in time. Um, with a few words on the historical context and then bringing us to the present juncture with the present circumstances uh, that we face. In the second section, we look at regionalization as a first step towards uh, full-fledged global globalization. Um, I'll discuss the quantitative and qualitative benefits uh, of financial integration that we, we found in our analysis in the book and also discuss a little bit the state of play of where Latin America stands relative to other regions in the world in terms of its level of integration. In the third section, my colleague Carlos is going to take us through some of the nuts and bolts of what actually needs to happen uh, in order for regional integration to take place in a safe and stable way, discussing risks and mitigation factors, existing initiatives and recommendations that we have from our uh, work on the book before leaving you with some conclusions. So why is this a theme that we believe is interesting and important today. Uh, first, a few words on the historical context. As everybody here knows, in the 1980s and 1990s, many Latin American countries went through financial crises, after which they opened up their markets and economies to foreign participation. In the 2000s, we had many banks from North America and Europe coming into the region, uh, Citibank, Santander, BBVA, HSBC, to name a few. And these banks were seen as a source of stability uh, not only bringing in capital, but also technical know-how and best practices to the region. The global financial crisis marked a turning point, in a sense, because uh, the global financial regulatory framework has changed a lot since the crisis and become a lot more stringent. So you have ring fencing of both liquidity and capital for subsidiaries of global banks in different parts of the world. You have tighter AML-CFT regulations. You've got the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act in the United States, issues of correspondent banking, etc. All of this has made the costs of having subsidiaries in different parts of the world and emerging countries much more costly for banks. And we've seen global banks retrenching from their non-core business areas and non-core regions. 
In this next slide, we show just a snapshot of some of the retrenchment that has taken place from countries in Latin America since the global financial crisis. You see for Peru in 2015, it was Citigroup, but there have been a large number of global banks that have retrenched from the region, and not just from Latin America, but also in other parts of the world. In addition, coinciding with this retrenchment of global banks, the region has been hit by a more challenging external environment in the last few years. Most Latin American countries are rich in natural resources and are exporters of commodities. These economies were boosted by high commodity prices through most of the 2000s, but since 2014, as the chart on the left shows, that there's been a sharp drop in commodity prices and also a big slowdown in growth uh, in China, which is a huge importer of, uh, of commodities from the region. So Chinese growth rates have gone from double digits to a more sustainable 6 to 8% average in recent years, and we expect that to continue. And commodity prices, the so-called commodity super cycle, seems to be over for the time being as well. The impact of that on Latin American economies can be seen, the initial impact can be seen already in the graph on the right, um, where we have LA7 growth rates at different vintages of time. The yellow bars show the average growth rates for 2005-2008. The orange bars are 2009, the global financial crisis. The light blue is 2010-2012, and then the dark blue on the right-hand side is 2013-2015, to and you can see the sharp drop. That's probably been exacerbated further in the last couple of years. In addition to a more difficult external environment, Latin American economies also face structural domestic challenges. And taking all of this together, we see a pretty, rel a pretty bleak outlook for medium-term growth in the region. In this chart, this chart basically shows estimates, IMF estimates in the World Economic Outlook of medium-term growth in Latin America at different points in time. We start with 4.5% back in 2000, that dipped down, but then came back up to 4.2% right before the crisis in 2009. And since 2014, you can see the sharp drop in uh, medium-term growth estimates for the region, ending at 2.6 in our latest estimate in 2017. So putting all this together um, and bringing it back to financial market development and integration, there are a few things happening. On the one hand, you have a void that's being left by global banking global banks that are departing the region, and this void needs to be filled if we're going to avoid a sharp drop in financial intermediation and competition in the Latin American region. At the same time, the commodity super cycle and high growth rates in China are no longer what we see and spell the need for new sources and new avenues of growth for the Latin American countries, which would require fresh investment, and fresh investment in turn would require deep financial markets. So. In a sense, global banks have withdrawn from the region at a time where the region most needs deeper financial markets, and Latin American countries will need to find a way to deepen and develop their financial markets more going forward. In the next section, we're going to look at regional financial integration as a step towards global financial integration. I will start by describing some quantitative analysis that we did in the second chapter of the book on A, looking at the extent of financial integration in Latin American countries, and B, how growth in the countries could benefit from increasing the amount of financial integration. Our analysis focused on seven countries in particular, which we refer to as the LA7, Peru, Brazil, Mexico, Chile, Colombia, Uruguay, and Panama. And in the first step of our analysis, we basically tried to quantify the degree of under or over financial integration in the LA7 countries given their economic fundamentals. Economic fundamentals such as per capita income, trade openness, quality of the institutions, public debt to GDP, history of financial crises, et cetera. What we did was we estimated fixed effect, fixed effect regressions for 66 countries over the period from 1986 to 2011. And um, our models basically related financial integration to a set of control variables. In each specification, we regressed the dependent variable, which was financial, a measure of financial integration, on its macroeconomic determinants and, um, and fixed effects. We then calculated the degree of over or under integration as the difference between the estimated fixed effect for each country or region and the sample average of all region or country fixed effects. What we found was that 
the LSA seven countries did indeed seem to have a level of under-integration given their economic fundamentals relative to the sample average. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the chart that we show. The, the chart here shows the LA7, the blue bars show the financial integration gap um, in the LA7 countries relative to the sample average. The orange squares are the results for Peru in particular. Uh, the average gap for the LA7 was a coefficient of 0 0.3 to 0 0.4, and actually Peru was right in line with that average. Um, a little bit on the different specifications we used. So the difference between the baseline and the alternative specifications we see here is basically the definition of the dependent variable. So financial integration is a tricky variable to, to, to sort of define. There's no standard definition for it, and we tried different specifications for, uh, for the, to, to try and get a best fit for how to measure this concept. In our baseline specification, we basically used um, principal component analysis on two variables, openness measured as external assets and liabilities as a ratio to GDP, and convergence, which was proxied as the regional dispersion of stock market returns using the Morgan Stanley Capital Interactions Index for different countries in the region. In our, second, in our first alternative uh, to the baseline, we had a very similar measure. So it, the, uh, once again, it was a principal component of two variables, openness and convergence, except this time openness was just external liabilities to, to GDP rather than external liabilities and assets to GDP. In the second alternative, we added depth as a third component. So it was a principal component of three variables, openness, convergence, and depth, which was measured through private credit to GDP. And finally, in the third alternative, we added, um, in addition to global openness and regional convergence, a special variable for regional integration. Um, in all specifications, as I mentioned, we found that the LA7 countries, given their economic fundamentals, seem to have a level of under-integration, a gap, um, relative to the sample average. Our next step was, given this integration gap that we found, to try and quantify what the benefits to growth would be of filling the gap. We did that by uh, estimating standard GDP growth equations with a measure for financial integration. Uh, which we did through instrumental variable analysis. The results are are, of our analysis showed that a positive correlation between economic performance and financial integration with elasticities ranging from 0.01 to 0.02 that we found in the first step, which was about 0 0.3, 0 0.4. We calculate a pretty sizable growth dividend from filling the gap of between a quarter and three quarter percentage points of growth every year. For Peru, the estimated integration gap ranged from 0.3 to 0.4, which was right in line with the LA7 average. And so the growth dividend from filling the gap again would be a quarter to three quarter percentage points. Moving from the quantitative to the qualitative benefits, the qualitative benefits of financial integration are many and uh, well established. Financial integration can expand financing and saving options for people, which can enhance financial market development and thereby growth in many different ways. The infusion of foreign capital can enhance competition, economies of scale, increasing the efficiency of financial sectors and reducing spreads, which can stimulate investment. The importation of technical know-how and um, best practices can boost productivity. And also the exposure of po political and private sector agents to international scrutiny and standards can help raise the bar and therefore sort of trigger countries to improve their investment climate as well. In addition, integration can also enhance stability by reducing growth volatility, both through increasing the depth and liquidity of financial markets and also through providing more opportunities for portfolio di diversification. So given these well-established benefits from global financial integration and the reality that global banks are currently departing from the region, there is definitely a space for greater regional financial integration as a step towards potentially increasing global financial integration in the future. And in particular, regional integration of financial markets and greater cross-border financial activity could be a first step towards greater commercial integration in the region, which is also quite low. Regional banks can have a better understanding of the specific needs of the region in terms of trade, credit, as well as specific risk, risk management factors. Regional banks can help fill the void that's being left by the departing global banks, avoiding a credit crunch or an overconsolidation and reduction in competition in the financial sectors of the different countries. 
In addition, the assimilation of technical know-how and best practices from a regulatory and operational standpoint from regional leaders can help the entire region move towards higher standards and set the stage for uh, more easy sort of global integration at some point in the future. In addition, the capital markets in many countries in the region are quite small, um, and regional integration of these capital markets could help facilitate um, economies of scale and also help finance infrastructure projects, for example, that are necessary in many of the countries. And finally, regional integration could help avoid bubbles developing in many of the small domestic capital markets of the region and help with diversification of portfolios. Before handing over to my colleague, I just want to set the stage a little bit with a state of play of where uh, financial integration in Latin America currently stands relative to other regions. On this slide, the left-hand chart shows um, three regions, Latin America, Emerging Market Asia, and Emerging Europe. The blue bars show the share of each region's exports and global exports, and the red bars show the share of regional exports, and we can see that in Latin America, regional exports are as a share of the total exports of the region are, are lower than the other two areas. In the right-hand side chart, we show total portfolio investment allocations of the LA7 countries. And the red bars, which are very thin on, in most cases, are the Latin American share of total portfolio investment. We can see that it's very low compared to, for example, the purple, which is the United States. Blue is for other countries, et cetera. In this slide, we look more closely at financial integration. On the left-hand side, we show for the different regions, basically, their external assets and liabilities as a share of total global external assets and liabilities. The black line is on the right-hand side, and that's in advanced economies, which still dwarf the rest of the world. But we can see that the orange line, which is, which is going upwards, is emerging Asia, which has in increased its share of global assets and liabilities in the last, uh, in the last few years, whereas Latin America has the thick red line in the middle, and we can see that it's remained relatively flat. On the right-hand side, we have a chart that looks at um, intra-regional investing, so FDI and portfolio assets outstanding. Basically, the lines, the dotted lines show portfolio, and the bold red line shows um, FDI, which is on the right-hand side of the scale, and it shows the share of regional FDI and portfolio assets and total FDI and portfolio assets of each of the regions. Latin America is in red, and we can see that there hasn't been much upward movement, particularly relative to emerging Asia, which is the orange line right at the top. With that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Carlos, to take us through the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Diva. Muy buenas tardes y como decía Diva, estamos muy contentos de poder estar acá hablándoles un poco de, de nuestro libro de integración financiera. And I'm going to switch back to English to continue with the second half of the presentation. Um, just before talking about uh, how to achieve financial integration in practice, I just wanted to finish with a couple of slides on the state of play of the subsectors of the financial sector. So I'm going to start with uh, the banking sector, and as you all know, uh, this is the dominant sector within the financial sector. But something that I wanted to, to raise here is that if you look at the regionalization of the sector in the region as a whole, it remains fairly low. And in the chart there, if you see in terms of ownership of the banking sector by regional players, you can see that the yellow bit is only big in Panama, and that's just really reflecting the large presence of Colombian banks uh, in the Panamanian domestic banking sector. But for the region as a whole, uh, this regionalization of the banking sector remains fairly small. And in fact, uh, finding examples of regional players there uh, is actually quite difficult. There's only a couple of them. In terms of, uh, for example, specialized banking, investment banking, there's BTG Pactual. But it's a bank that, as I say, is only in the sector of investment banking and doesn't go into the universal, more retail side of the banking sector. Perhaps the only example we have in the region of a bank that is really following a universal model and going to the other countries uh, with that is uh, Itaú. But even closer to home, I mean, uh, regionalization of the banking sector remains fairly limited. There's only a couple of examples. They say on the side of the Peruvian institutions going abroad, you have, of course, Credit Corp. Uh, that owns uh, Banco de Crédito de Peru, and with BCP, Bolivia is an important subsidiary in Bolivia. And 
on the other side of the coin, uh, foreign banks or regional banks uh, coming to Peru. You have a couple of examples, Banco Azteca or Banco Falabella from Chile. But these are more like small, medium-sized banks specialized much more on, on the retail um, sectors that their, their conglomerates were following it. So again, all, all this to say is, you know, that regional integration through the banking sector remains fairly limited in Latin America. If you look at other sectors, uh, pension funds, uh, that's another sector that's, as Diva pointed out, we analyze as well in the book and we have a chapter about it. But the points that I want you to, to take from here is that first, that there's a very rapid growth in pension fund assets in the region and that's something that we see in, in quite a few of the countries. But the second thing is when you look at the chart here at the bottom, these are the limits, uh, basically the regulatory limits on how much this pension fund can invest their assets abroad. And something that you can see is perhaps with the only exception of Chile, uh, most of the pension funds in the region are very close to the limit on how much they can invest abroad. So, you know, there's some scope perhaps there for moving a little bit of, of these limits and, and allowing much more regionalization. Chile is a very specific case because, I mean, they're far away from the statutory limit, but they have all the secondary limits that prevent uh, pension funds from going abroad. For example, uh, pension funds can only invest in countries that have a country rating at least as good as the Chilean one. So uh, pretty much that de facto excludes most of the countries in the region. If we move to capital markets, in five years, the story is quite the opposite. As I was saying, pension funds are growing quite rapidly in most of the countries in the region, while capital markets remain very small and very shallow in most of the countries in the region, perhaps with the exception of uh, Mexico and Peru, uh, Mexico and Brazil, sorry. And, and this creates uh, some issues because then you have basically a pension system that is growing quite a lot, but very shallow capital markets in which this pension fund uh, can invest domestically. And again, Another point that I wanted to raise, the regionalization of uh, the capital markets remains fairly limited in the region. So as I say, overall, basically the message I want you to take is there's a very limited uh, regionalization so far in the subsectors of the financial uh, system in Latin America. So how can we achieve a much more integration in practice? Well, I mean, you heard that Diva was talking quite a lot about uh, the benefits of integration, but also with uh, benefits of integration, you also can have risks of, of integration. And, and in particular here, I just wanted to talk about three risks uh, that further integration can pose. The first one is, is this idea of trade diverting rather than trade creating. And, and something that we're very clear in the book is, yes, we are advocating for regionalization, but not as a substitute uh, for more openness and globalization, but rather, you know, regionalization as a complement for further openness. So that's something that we want to make clear that we don't want to divert trade and, and integration from other regions uh, towards uh, fa favoring uh, Latin America in particular. The second one and probably the biggest risk is the risk of spillover or more large financial uh, stability risks. And with that, I mean, something that can exacerbate that if there's a lack of adequacy in the existing regulatory frameworks. So I'm going to be speaking a little bit more about that in, in the next couple of slides. So when we analyze in the book uh, the existing spillover risks, I mean, whether we do the analysis using actual exposures of cross-border exposure between the different financial institutions, or whether we look at market data, something that we see is that currently uh, these spillovers are fairly small. And, and as Diva was saying also, you know, this is not only reflecting that there's very few uh, financial interconnectedness between the region at the moment, but also there's very few trade linkages and, and other sort of linkages. But that doesn't mean that there's uh, room for complacency. And, and in fact, this is something that we emphasize quite a lot in the book, that yes, these, although the current limits of potential financial stability risks with spillovers are low, they're likely to increase with further integration. So integration has to go hand in hand with strengthening the regulatory frameworks to be able to deal with these increasing risks. And there we see three principal pillars uh, how to deal with that. The first one, I guess it's pretty obvious, is more cooperation among the regional supervisors. And this involves, for example, for example having uh, supervisory colleges for the big banks or financial institutions that have cross-border exposures, but also having MOUs, more exchange of information, et cetera. The second one, and perhaps the most important pillar here, is enhancing the domestic uh, regulatory framework. So for instance, the adoption of the best regulatory practices, Basel II, 2.5, Basel III in case of the banking sector, solvency II type in case of insurances but also being able to conduct uh, consolidated and conglomerate supervision when these groups that have a financial and non-financial side become more interconnectedness and, and more, much more complex and big. 
And in some cases, the third pillar of that is using prudential tools. So with this increase in systemicity, if you want, or systemic risk coming from these larger and more complex financial institutions, perhaps it's warranted in some cases to have additional capital and liquidity charges to account for this increase in, in risk in those institutions. And this is just a chart that perhaps is, hasn't been updated uh, recently, but just to show that the degree of basically implementations on Basel II, Basel III, and other types of, of, of uh, best practices in the region has been very different in the different countries. So there's really a need for kind of homogenizing the speed at which all these different, um, different rules are implemented in the different countries. Then uh, the second big, um, if I can call it like the second big venue for financial integration that can be done in practice is using the existing platforms that are already there. And Mercosur has been a little bit dormant over the last couple of decades, but maybe with a few of the political changes that we've seen in a few of the member countries, there's some scope for a revitalization of, of the Mercosur, especially of financial Mercosur. But moving closer to home, and the Pacific Alliance could be a, a very good platform in which integration could start by the four members there, and then reaching a wider audience or spectrum of countries uh, through more integration in the Pacific Alliance. And within the Pacific Alliance, MILA is, is a very specific tool that could be used for, for the integration. And we have a, an entire chapter in the book that deals about uh, these different alliances. And I'm just going to have a, one or two slides in, in a couple of slides just giving a specific recommendations about that. But I think uh, with that, I, I just want to move for to, to just mention some of the recommendations that we we include in the book. So the first one is really this notion that we should have a really non-discretionary kind of regulatory framework that allows free entry and exit. And, and the important thing there is that it doesn't differentiate too much whether the player is coming from outside or from inside the country. So really a, a level playing field if, if you want in the financial sector. The second one is the harmonization of the regulatory and accounting frameworks, but really towards the best uh, practices out there. Uh, the third one is, as I was mentioning before, the importance of having a strong consolidated supervision in the countries that can allow them uh, to deal with this increase in risk uh, coming from more sophisticated financial institutions in the countries. A, a very specific one is, is taxation. And this is something that we went to in the, the region with my colleagues. Uh, this is something that a lot of uh, people mentioned as being one of the biggest obstacles. And there have been progress there. In fact, we just heard that uh, a few weeks ago there was uh, some taxation reforms in, in the case of MILA to avoid especially the issue of double taxation. But even just homogenizing the rules and the requirements uh, for disclosure regarding to taxes, uh, that would be a, a big step towards reducing the bottlenecks uh, that could allow for more regional integration. Exchange of controls, uh, perhaps that's not really a, a, an applicable case in, in the case of Peru, uh, especially here, if anything, the problem is dollarization is too high, but you have all the countries in which dollarization is basically zero and perhaps there's some scope for not having high dollarization, but just relaxing a little bit of those, um, those um, limits on, on net open effects positions, for example, the holding of, of effects accounts uh, by domestic agents. And the final one is, as I was mentioning before, the pension funds. Perhaps there, there's a lot of scope for modifying or relaxing a little bit the limits on the pension funds, and especially whether there's a scope for these pension funds to participate much more in financing large infrastructure projects that can be uh, cross-border within the region. In case of the Pacific Alliance, I just borrow a few uh, recommendations from our chapter there. So the first one that we were mentioning is to create a small secretariat. Now, the way it works at the moment is that you have a secretariat that is moving from country to country and that doesn't have a permanent staff, but is borrowing basically a staff from the different ministries uh, to chair the presidency of, of this rotating, uh, or the rotating presidency in these countries. But having a, a much more focused uh, staff in, in one of the countries could be a way of moving this agenda forward and giving some continuity. The second one could be to allow for cross-border investment in the Pacific Alliance to be recognized uh, throughout the different countries. And even to move, for example, MILA to the current, uh, moving it from, from the current uh, equities trading platform, which is the only thing that, that it does, to including fixed income instruments. And of course, I think what I was saying before, this issue of harmonizing procedures, harmonizing the regulation, that's something that is going to simplify and incentivate much more turnover uh, in MILA. So with that, I probably I just want to close with a, with a few takeaways. So, so really what I want you to take from here is, is that when we think about financial integration, and that's the whole spirit of the book, 
is that we're not saying that, you know, this is the solution for all the problems in Latin America. Rather, we just see it as a first step towards a re-globalization re of, of the financial sector in the region. And this comes really from something that Diva was mentioning before, is when we look at the current juncture that we have on the one hand, we have a slowing economy, a lot of macroeconomic long-term challenges for the region, a rise in economic nationalism in parts of the world. And on the other hand, these changes in the global regulatory frameworks that are making some of these global banks to reassess a little bit their business models, and in some cases retrench from the region. So given that context, maybe regional integration in the financial sector is one first step towards this reopening of the financial sectors towards the world. And as I say on, on, my, on my part of the presentation, I mean, of course, this increase in integration is likely to increase risk. So it's very important that we create the regulatory frameworks and supervisory frameworks um, adequately to, to deal with this increase in risk and the harmonization of these regulatory frameworks not only to make them the same as them, but really this should be a race to the top towards having the best regulatory frameworks in each of the countries. And that in per se, I think, is a, is a good thing in itself. So I think with that, I'm just going to open the floor to some questions that you might have. 